All right, let's go to the fourth chapter of CannabisAndCollegeHealth.com. We're going to go to the support chapter. Where we last left off, we left at the curves showing the relationship between endocannabinoid receptor 1 in purple, the release of dopamine in brown, depression and anxiety in red, and uh, 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 THC use in green. Can these curves be reversed as we left off in the last chapter? There is evidence that they can. That's good news and that's positive evidence. Earlier, we discussed a PET scan study that looked at a PET scan of regular chronic cannabis users and non-users. They used a radio ligand to measure endocannabinoid receptor 1. You may remember that in the study, those using cannabis on a regular chronic basis had 20% less endocannabinoid receptors. You can find, again, the reference under the spinning asterisk. Let's see what else they found in the study. It's a very elegant study. So we already discussed this result, the decrease in endocannabinoid receptors. Then they did something very interesting and very unusual. They took the 30 subjects and they placed them in a locked research unit for 28 days with no cannabis. This is somewhat similar to a high-quality rehab program in that there should be no cannabis uh, or contraband uh, available. Sometimes that's not always the case. But it's obviously different than rehab because rehab is treatment. Rehab is not just isolating people. It's, av- it's rather uh, teaching people and giving support and connection and therapy. So it's entirely different. But at least in the one aspect of being in a specified and in- intentional substance-free location, that's what's similar here. So let's see what they found. So they put the, the, the folks, regular chronic cannabis users, who had on average had 20 percent less endocannabinoid receptors. They put them in the research unit for 28 days. Then they gave them another PET scan. There's no need to put the controls in the PET scanner again because they did not go into the research unit. This is just the folks that were regular chronic cannabis users. And this is the good news. Perhaps somewhat surprising, but good news nevertheless. After 28 days of abstinence in the locked research unit, the number of CB1 receptors increased. And this is a very interesting finding. Chronic cannabis users had just as many endocannabinoid receptors as those in the control group who hadn't used cannabis. This is a very, and perhaps surprising, but positive finding. I think it's encouraging, and I think it has clinical ramifications. Check out the reference uh, if you want to read the article itself. So this goes back to our diagram of the interaction of these four aspects. And in this graph, you see the uh, total cessation of cannabis use followed by the PET scan finding of endocannabinoid receptors returning to full levels. Is there any evidence that reducing frequent cannabis use can help with anxiety, depression, and cognition? There are two studies that suggest this. One shows the benefits of stopping frequent cannabis on depression and anxiety, or anxiety and depression. The second shows the benefits of stopping frequent cannabis on cognition. Let's look at the first one. The first one is a study of 125 patients with cannabis use. Frequent cannabis use and depression were treated with a brief motivational interviewing intervention. This is the study that I discussed at the outset of the uh, presentation. The subjects were assessed for cannabis use, depression, anxiety for six months after the motivational interviewing intervention. The authors looked at those that decreased cannabis use and those that didn't. So they're going to assess them uh, at at baseline three months and six months, those who use cannabis and those that discontinued cannabis use. So the top is those that continued use, the bottom is, are those that discontinued use. Those that stopped cannabis had more improvement in depression, anxiety, and overall function. Again, I discussed this study at the beginning of the presentation. This is a very compelling study. It was done in California, and it shows that reducing cannabis use improves depression, anxiety, and overall functioning. Very interesting study. The authors conclude that this study found that marijuana use was common and associated with poor recovery among psychiatry outpatients with depression. If depression patients were more aware that ongoing symptoms of distress is linked to marijuana use, they might be more likely to cut down. At least I think they have a right to know. Here's a different study. This is frequent cannabis use and cognition. There's a longitudinal study that assessed 70 youth for cognition and cannabis use. Also a very interesting study. In this study, they assessed the IQ in individuals aged 9 to 12 years of age. They assumed this to be before people started cannabis use. Sometimes people will start before age 12, but in this case, that was the assumption that they hadn't started cannabis use. And then they assessed them later, years later, at age 17 to 20. Again, IQ test. And they also did a cannabis assessment, a questionnaire, and also a urine drug screen. So they're testing IQ at, before using, potentially using cannabis at age 17 to 20 and seeing who has used cannabis. 
Here's what they find. Let's go to the top of the graph first. Current, can current heavy cannabis users, uh, heavy use was uh, equal or greater than five joints per week. And we see the cannabis use there. And here are individuals that started to use cannabis and then stopped on their own spontaneously at least three months before the age 17 to 20 IQ assessment. So I hope this graph is clear. Those that started and continues to use cannabis and those in the cohort who had started and discontinued on their own with a minimum of three, inch bef three months before the IQ was tested again. What did they find? Current users, their IQ dropped 4.0 points on their IQ test on average. Uh, those were current users. People that had used and had stopped, their IQ rose 3.5 points. Interesting finding there. The former users, those that had stopped users, were in fact regular users. The study states that on average they used five per, per person, 5,793 joints over an, av over an average of 3.2 years before they stopped on their own. So these are, you know, frequent users before they stopped. I think that's worth noting. Former users had no difference in IQ increases compared to current light users and non-users. So if someone used cannabis, even if they used regularly and heavily, and they discontinued for three months, there's no evidence that that cannabis use had any negative impact on their IQ. Interesting study. Support. How do you support a student with a mental health concern who uses, who uses cannabis frequently? We already talked about asking about it, the importance of screening. Not asking about cannabis use is a missed opportunity to know the patient. Education, including education about the endocannabinoid resist, receptor, if you're comfortable with that. Sometimes education alone is enough for patients to consider and make changes. What are some of the support options? Individual therapy, group therapy, 12-step recovery, family meetings, day program, rehab, and other treatment options or combination thereof. As mentioned earlier in this presentation, don't lose focus on cannabis use if cannabis use is an issue. Um, keep it an ongoing conversation. Avoid the temptation to create another diagnosis in order to have something to do as a professional. Lastly, respect autonomy. Patients are the ones who will decide what they do. Some patients will reconsider their substance use, their cannabis use, after information, education, and support that we've discussed here. At least that's my experience. And a percentage, a small percentage, I would say a minority percentage of uh, individuals will opt to continue to use, and that's their choice, and that's their autonomy in the outpatient setting. That's sometimes an outcome. The importance is avoiding misdiagnosis, misdiagnosis or adding unnecessary medications, which incur their own risks. So this concludes this, this presentation and also concludes the overview of the app. I hope the app is useful to you, um, and I hope this presentation is useful to you, and I hope you have a great day.